Good evening. I'm Marilyn Krishner, curator and head of the Department of Prints, Photographs, and Architectural Collections at New York Historical Society. And I'm joined by Ted Merwin, PhD, author of Pastrami on Ryan, Overstuffed History of the Jewish Deli. And he's also an exhibition consultant for this show. I really highly recommend his book, which is on sale in our shop. Tomorrow, we, tonight we will be discussing the exhibition I'll have, which he's having, The Jewish Deli. Before we begin, I would like to thank our trustees, our chairman's council, and all of our members and other generous donors. Your support allows New York Historical to continue to pursue our mission. The New York Historical Society is currently open on Wednesday through Sunday, so please reserve your timed entry tickets on our website. Before we launch into our program, I want to let you know that it will last approximately 45 minutes, including 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end, which you can submit through the Q&A function on your Zoom screen at any point during the presentation. We have disabled the chat function, so please do make sure you use the Q&A. After the presentation, we will get to as many questions as time allows. So uh, here is the beginning of our exhibition. I'll have what she's having. And one of the things that I am struck by at, with, when we discuss this with anybody people come in with memories. This is a show of memories um, that's produced differently. Everybody has a different memory of their relationship to Jewish delis, um, to the immigration of any kind of people into America. I'd like to talk about that tonight. I wanna to talk about the history of this exhibition, um, more so the history of why all of this happened and what it means to us, how this history relates to the history of the United States in terms of immigration, in terms of populations moving west, in terms of traditions, as Tevye used to say, would say tradition, it is so important. Um, so could I have the next slide, please? And Ted, you're gonna, I'm gonna bring you into this now. Um, this is about immigration and food. And do you wanna talk about what we see on the left screen and the crowds of people this time in color, um, as we know it was like on the Lower East Side at the time, but this really brings it to life. Um, sure, first of all, I just wanna say thank you for inviting me to uh, participate in this program. It was a real pleasure to, uh, to consult um, on it. It was um, a year of uh, you know, really fascinating work with the, with the museum and uh, you know, with um, you know the um, a lot of the a lot of the items in the in the exhibit come from the the museum, um, but also I was actually very glad that I was able to lend a few items from my own personal collection to um, to the show, and um, also to be able to make some connections to other collectors um, who who ended up also being able to uh, to do the same. So, um, you know, I spent. Uh, more than 10 years um, collecting memorabilia relating to the Jewish deli, neon signs and light up clocks and all kinds of menus and matchbooks and postcards and et cetera, et cetera. And most of them are just sitting in my house <laughs> gathering dust um, and have been waiting for this opportunity to be able to really, um, you know, bring them to life. And uh, so, um, you know, it's uh, really a thrill. To, you know, and, and and when I was at the 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 opening of the exhibit, you know, it was clear that this was something that really, um, you know, was meaningful to you know to a lot of people, and 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 I understand that um, you know it's a popular exhibit. It's one that um, people really are are flocking to, and uh, also has gotten quite a lot of media attention. Um, it started, of course, in the uh, at the Square Bowl in uh in los angeles i was i was able to actually go out there and see it in that incarnation and and give a talk in connection with with uh you know that exhibit and um it's also just been a great pleasure to see it coming to new york and i know it's going to be going from here to chicago and houston and other places so uh, again thank you so much and um you know i do i do want to say that um you know there's a there's a kind of uh really interesting tension i would say when we think about the deli between the history of the deli and the nostalgia that many of us have for it. And um, one of the kind of core assumptions that I started out with when I started doing the research for the book, which was already about 15, 20 years ago, um, was that the sort of 
you know, height of the Jewish deli in New York in some ways, um, the the sort of root, you know, the or the or the origin in many ways of the, you know, what became such an important part of Jewish culture. And, um, you know, I think we'll see tonight, although all of us probably already know, um, really iconic part of New York culture and American culture um, by, by extension. Um, you know, really started in that immigrant with that immigrant generation, those Eastern European Jews who came here um, from the Palace settlement and um, who were, you know, uh, had hard lives, you know, were, were homesick, were often hungry, you know, um, really wanted to um, establish a foothold in the country, but really had a hard time doing so. They spoke a foreign language, you know, most of them spoke Yiddish and sometimes other languages as well, didn't speak English. Um, and, um, you know, really sort of had a kind of tremendous level of homesickness and, 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 and the foods that they enjoyed when they were back in Poland and Romania and Hungary and Lithuania and all those places. Um, and, um, you know, and, and also, you know, I was thinking that, you know, like every immigrant group or ethnic group, um, has its own kind of, um, distinctive gathering place, um, where, where people can you know, hang out and um, sort of share their, um, you know, their their experience as, as being strangers in a strange land, so to speak. And that, you know, maybe for the Irish, you know, it was uh, the local pub, you know, um, <laughs> um, and, and, um, and for the Jews, it was, it was centered around food and it was the deli and places like that. But Ted, and, I have to ask you one question looking at all of this too. Yeah. When you, when you look at the photograph on the left in terms of, you know, making themselves comfortable and making a, a home for them here, it's mainly the women and the children. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the image on the right, it's the men, I would assume, or I would think that oftentimes the men would come first to set up and then the women would follow. Um, is that the case or not? Um, that's the case for most immigrant groups. It's less mm -hmm. so for it was less so for for Eastern European Jews. I mean, they tended to come more as whole families. They were driven, often driven out of where they lived, as 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 we know by anti-Semitism, pogroms, and so on. They really had no place to go back to. So unlike maybe Irish or Italian, you know, um, you know, men who um, could come to America, make some money, send it back. I mean, that's still a common pattern even nowadays, you know, um, send, send money back to their family in the old country and hopefully bring the, the rest of their, their their wives and children over. So, uh, they, yeah, so they, they, they started with push carts, right? And and those eventually, could I have the next slide, please? They tell, you know, so then they opened the delicatessen, which is really, um, Essen is to eat in German and delicate is good food, right? So it's, uh, so what happened? It, it went from the push carts to the store like this, correct? Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to, if I, if I might, I just wanted to finish yeah. just what I was saying about the immigrant experience, okay. um, which I found was really not accurate. I mean, the, the assumptions that I had made that, um, and for reasons that I think are, you know, you, you could probably guess, um, why the deli actually really didn't take off in the immigrant period. Um, it wasn't, um, it really wasn't an immigrant phenomenon in a lot of ways. There was a, there was a survey that was done on the Lower East Side in the, on the, in the 10th Ward of the Lower East Side, which is like the heart of the Jewish Lower East Side, you know, Orchard Street, Christie Street, Delancey Street, Hester Street in 1899. And um, they found 10 delis in 1899 when there were, hundreds of thousands of Jews who were living um, in that neighborhood. It was considered by some to be the most crowded place on the face of the earth, you know, more than like Calcutta and Bombay and places that were seen as like really, you know, just inhumanely crowded. Um, so, you know, it's hard to square that with our, you know, as I said, with our nostalgia, with our sort of image of the Delhi as, oh, you know, it's like we go back to Lower East Side because we want to be in that neighborhood where all the you know, where the delis were and people were eating this kind of food and they, they actually really weren't eating this kind of food. It's interesting you should say that because the photograph we're looking at right now is up in Harlem. In 1910. Yeah, but it's 1910. So it's already a little bit later. Uh -huh. um, by 1910, you know, there was, and I'm not saying there weren't, you know, obviously I'm not saying there weren't any delis, but Jewish immigrants, at least when they first got here, you know, obviously still tended to be rather poor. They often didn't really trust um, the meat that wasn't 
you know, cooked by themselves at home because there were no real kashrut, there were no kosher certifying agencies the way there are now. So, and and we'll see in a, in a, in a moment that you know um, there were a lot of scandals that actually sort of erupted over you know uh, kosher sausage companies that were making a profit on selling meat that wasn't actually kosher um, and calling it kosher. Um, and so, you know, and also there was, there was a desire to be more American and to be American was, you know, I mean, there are, there are wonderful photos of the, um, you know, the settlement houses, um, like Grand Street and whatever, where, you know, they dressed up these immigrant women in these like starched white, you know, aprons, and they marched them into these like gleaming white kitchens. And, you know, it's been said that as food becomes more American, it becomes softer and whiter. And so the, the whole idea that Jews would cling to um, just like, you know, I mean, you think about it for Italian food or Mexican food. I mean, food that's very spicy, food that has a sharp odor, that's very pungent. You know, you eat it. It has a lot of garlic in it. <laughs> Jewish food has a lot of garlic. Um, Jews were stereotyped during that. I mentioned this in the book. Jews were stereotyped um, for hundreds of years, you know, you know, obviously back into the Middle Ages. Um, for eating garlic and that you would walk into even the home of a very wealthy German Jewish, you know, burger or whatever, and, and, and would smell of garlic and, you know, that kind of thing. The only way to cleanse the Jew from the stench of garlic was to convert him to Christianity, that kind of rhetoric, you know, so these Jews came to the Lower East Side and, you know, like they didn't want necessarily to be seen as so far and unassimil unassimilable. At the, on the other hand, you know, you know, what's interesting about the deli is that it was a Jewish, as I said, you know, it was a Jewish space that was very casual, I guess you would say, you know. What was I mean, this deli, the, the interior bloom deli, was that Jewish food they were selling up in Harlem? Yeah, Harlem was a Jewish neighborhood. I mean, really, I mean, 1910 is a little bit early, but um, certainly by the end of the First World War into the 1920s, you know, Jews are moving in very large numbers. There's a big exodus out of the Lower East Side. Jews are leaving the Lower East Side as quickly as they can um, with the building of the subway up through Upper Manhattan to the Bronx, with the building of the Williamsburg Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge to Brooklyn. Um, Jews are moving to the outer boroughs and they're, you know, they're becoming a little bit more part of the mainstream of, of American society. Well, okay, so it's interesting you should say that. And it's interesting that I've set up these slides this way because could I have the next slide, please? Here is a Jewish deli on Delancey Street, which, which is downtown, right? 1929. But the next slide, please, we could go back to this one, is another deli that, as you said, is moving out because it's in Queens in 1931. So that they're moving, they're all, you, that this is when the delis began, began their first, let's say, diaspora out of the uh, out of downtown and into the other boroughs. Eventually it's gonna be out to the suburbs, which we'll talk about. But I think it's fascinating to follow where the delis went because that's where the Jews were going, right? Do you wanna- And 1931 is early for Queens. Queens was really uh -huh. the suburbs in 1931. Yeah. <laughs> there weren't a lot of Jews living in Queens in the early 1930s. There were a lot of Jews who were living in Brooklyn and the Bronx mm -hmm. and upper Manhattan. There were not a lot of Jews in Queens. Um, Queens was like still a lot of farmland. And then, you know, obviously like Queens bordering on Long Island um, mm -hmm. where like all the potato farms and everything were. And so, yeah, I mean, this is early for um, for a kosher deli in Queens. But what's interesting about Bronfman's is it, it relates to what I was, Bronfman's was the like, you know, one of the prime offenders in terms of, uh, you know, pulling this fast one on the kosher <laughs> consumers. And there were actually, articles in the Yiddish newspapers uh, in the early 1930s saying that if anyone had, you know, I mean, obviously unwittingly purchased Bronfman products and had consumed them at home, then they needed not just to throw out whatever the, the meat that they had purchased, but they basically needed to throw out, you know, all their pots and pans and dishes and cutlery and everything because it was not kosher anymore, you know. And, and did they do that? Did they did a lot of them do knows. that? I mean, that's the kind of that's that's always the question that a historian has. You know, you see uh -huh. things in the media and you wonder did people actually do it or not, you know. Um, you don't really know. But um uh, you know, I mean I I I think it probably even still happens to this day. I mean, it's just it's so tempting for these companies to um, you know, because there's such a spread between the 
Although meat, actually meat costs really rose very, very quickly over the last 20 years or so. And, and now it's that they're actually not as high as they, as they were. Um, and I'm not sure why I heard a story about this on the radio the other day that, um, you know, beef prices at least have come, have come down a little bit lately, but it's still a very, very expensive and risky proposition, obviously to open any kind of a restaurant, but um, we can get into this later if you want. But delis are, I mean, I think one of the reasons why a lot of delis have closed in recent years is because they're just not making enough of a profit margin on, uh, you know, on, on sandwiches or whatever. I mean, they have to charge like $20 for a sandwich. Well, well, I do know that when I go to buy a kosher brisket in a Jewish supermarket, it's a lot more expensive than in a non-Jewish supermarket. So it's still more expensive. Well, it is. And if you buy it, I mean, like, you know, for Thanksgiving, we bought a turkey from Grow and Behold, which is one of these like kosher organic, you know, like, um, you know, totally environmentally, you know, sustainable to the max kind of companies. And it's, you know, so expensive. It's a small fortune, I think. It is. Um, can I have the next one? Because we're talking about food. Next slide, please. So tell us about all this food. I know that bottle in the middle is yours, right? That is mine. That's my kitchen table <laughs> with my sign behind it, which you can't really see from the probably late 19 teens, early 1920s from a uh -huh. cookster sausage company in Chicago. Um, but um, it gets into the, you know, I mean, I think one of the things that this, um, these slides get into is that, of course, it wasn't just about food, but it was also about drink. <laughs> I mean, Dr. Brown's was this kind of, I guess it's kind of an apocryphal story about this doctor on the Lower East Side who would go around, you know, dispensing kind of probably like what we would call patent medicine to, you know, Jewish kids who had stomach, you know, complaints. And um, and that's why it's called cell ray tonic, you know? I mean, some people still call it cell ray tonic. I mean, eventually the FDA, you know, or whatever, I don't know if the FDA existed then, whether predecessor agency, you know, kind of cr cracked down on <laughs> on selling things as medicine when they hadn't actually been approved, you know, for, uh, you know, in that way. But, um, you know, certainly for a lot of people, I mean, if you see the seltzer bottle and I have a couple of seltzer bottles, I actually can't really see them behind me on, uh, on my, on my secretary. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of people sort of see, you know, it's sort of like cutting the grease or whatever, but I also like to think of it as like just this kind of, you know, the, the, the um, carbonation, you know, the, the bubbles, the sort of the effervescence, <laughs> like just the pure joy of, you know, of like being in a Jewish environment, eating Jewish food and being with other Jews. I mean, you know, I was saying before, there's kind of this idea of the deli. I mean, my book is really actually not so much about food as about the deli as this almost kind of secular synagogue as this like alternative gathering place for a generation of Jews who starting in the 20s and 30s, which is what we're still kind of talking about now, um, was really, you know, moving uh, away very rapidly from any kind of strict religious observance for the most part. Obviously, yes, there were Jews who still kept Orthodox and, and so on. But statistically, the second generation of Jews, like my grandparents' generation, um, who were my four grandparents were all born in this country. Um, they were all the children of immigrants, but they were all born here. Um, you know, they they were they were pretty secular. You know, uh, maybe they went to shul on the high holidays. Maybe they didn't go at all. You know, um, the deli was a place where they could be amongst sort of their own kind. You know, I mean, Harpo Marx, as is quoted in the exhibit, on Harpo, Harpo Marx writes in his book Harpo Speaks. Uh, um, that he loved coming back to New York with his brothers. Um, they were, they were, you know, grew up in East Harlem, and then they got famous doing vaudeville before they launched, you know, before the film industry kicked in. You know, they um, did vaudeville over the country. They came back to New York. He said, "When I came back to New York, he said, um, I had two homes away from home." He said, "Lindy's and Rubens." He said, "These were places where I found my people speaking my language with my accent." <laughs> and he talks about the, you know, the colorful cast of characters who are always there. It was he kind of makes it sound a lot like if you think about Damon Runyon stories, like guys, you know, the stories that are the basis for Guys and Dolls, and you know, Mindy's <laughs> restaurant and Guys and Dolls, where a number of the scenes take place, which is a very thinly disguised, you know, Lindy's. Um, it's really interesting to, you know, to think about like these delis that were located predominantly in the, in the theater district, right? So there were really two different kinds of delis. There were the delis that followed the Jews to the, to the outer boroughs um, that sprang up, you know, on every corner in 
Brownsville and the Grand Concourse and the East Bronx and all of these places, you know, um, and that were kosher because Jews, a lot of Jews lived a kind of bifurcated life in terms of their, in terms of their observance. I mean, it, to the extent that they would, you know, when they were, I mean, Sunday night was like the night to go out to the deli. My mother's uncle had a deli in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and she and her cousins would all kind of, you know, be pressed into service on Sunday nights. Um, it eventually went out of business because as the neighborhood got more and more um, orthodox and he was still open on Saturday, it became a big problem. But, um, you know, in the, in the heyday, you know, it was Sunday nights. And I think for a lot of, you know, more secular Jews, Sunday night in the deli was, you know, more important than Friday night in the synagogue. <laughs> well, you know, and it's also about the comfort food. You know, and, and this happens, what we see on the left of the screen, happens to be one of the most popular parts of the exhibition. And I don't know if it's because it's bringing back memories of things that our grandparents made. I look at that bowl of, 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 um, of chicken soup, matzo mm -hmm. ball soup, and I think of my grandmother's matzo ball soup, but her matzo balls were never that perfectly shaped. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. but it's those kinds of memories, I think, that really people are relating to when they come to see the exhibition. And, you know, it's so, it, you know, I, I think that the skirball hit it on the head when they talk about everything that's going on with the delis, but it, it sends a different message here in New York, which is something that Lenny Bruce once said, which was something to the effect, if you're Jewish in Wyoming, you're Goyish. And if you're Catholic in New York, you're Jewish. So it, it's a New York, it's really a New York, thing, um, as well as being a Jewish thing, which means it's all encomp encompassing. Could we have the next slide, please? Next slide. We could look at the food all night if we wanted to. Um, all right, so this is about uh, Jewish involvement in, uh, in the mid-century during the war years. And, and I have to do a hat, hats, hats off to Christian Panetta, who really did a lot of the research and, and took this exhibition to where it is right now. And I remember him saying that he finally found a letter in our archives about a young man who was sent a, a salami by his parents. And if you look at the bottom of the bottom image of the letter, it says, my mother sent, uh, sent me a salami and I got good fresh eggs from a, 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 an Italian peasant. And he goes on and on, but the idea that he got a salami in the in the in the middle of the war zone in Europe was something that brought them joy and it was a great thing that went on and also the idea of buying war bombs war bonds which you know was and this is a famous poster that was done by Norman Rockwell but this idea of how Jews really got together during the war and sent their children over there um, back to where they came from um, and yet had very close ties now to the U.S. Right. Yeah, no, I think that that's true. I mean, I think that, you know, the wartime period is an interesting one. Uh, I mean, the 30s was really, you know, in terms of trying to figure out what the heyday of the deli was, I was actually very surprised to find in the end that it was the 1930s. It was really at the height of the Great Depression. There were 1,550 kosher delicatessens in the five boroughs of, of New York alone. 1,550. I mean, that's just incredible number. It makes you think about you know, the role that the deli and all the associated industries, you know, the people who made the pickles and the paper goods and the scales and the slicers and the, you know, and the jobbers who delivered the food and, the, you know, whatever, like there was, and the people who made all the neon signs and <laughs> all that stuff, you know, that's in the exhibit. Um, but then the war happens, you know, and then you have a lot of Jewish, you know, guys who are going, um, you know, to very far off places to serve in the military. And, you know, and they really do, you know, crave that, that taste of home. And not only that, but, um, you know, they're surrounded by um, other soldiers who are from all different ethnic backgrounds who have never necessarily been uh, exposed to Jewish food. And they see that, you know, this guy, Ben, uh, gets a, a salami from his, from his mother in, in New York. And, um, and that becomes their first taste of Jewish, like their first experience of, of Jews, you know, maybe <laughs> in their in their combat unit or whatever, and their first taste of Jewish food. 
And, and that actually is really important um, because, I mean, I, I could say just in terms of the, the war bonds that there, you know, there was this famous profile in the New Yorker of Louis the waiter at the Sixth Avenue delicatessen who was like the top war bond seller. <laughs> you couldn't walk into that deli without him cornering you and, you know, like making you buy a war bond. Um, and that's what this makes me think of, you know, there, you know, and of course the other thing that, it, that, it, that I'm sure it makes a lot of people think of in terms of the one on the right, at least is the, the famous uh, slogan at Katz's and at other delis, you know, send a salami to your boy in the army, you know, um, it only rhymes if you say it with that, like Atterborough, you know, like my grandparents. But you know what it also points to? It also points to the history of the United States in a way, and the fact that the immigrants came here in the early part of the late 19th, early 20th century. But by the time of the Second World War, they're Americans, right? And they're Americans sending their boys over their, over to fight for the U.S., and and but then sending them a taste of something that goes back maybe to their you know to their own heritage but it's this idea of the immigrants becoming the americans and americanized by the mid 20th century could we have the next slide please um and so you have the these uh great delis but a lot of them are in midtown correct um or not well, yeah, I mean, so this is all about what, what you were just saying a moment ago. This is really all about Americanization, I think, in a lot of ways. I mean, it's about both because Jews are still, you know, not totally accepted um, in, in American society. I mean, is, I mean, after World War II, a lot of the, you know, sort of more genteel forms of anti-Semitism start to break away. If people have seen Gentleman's Agreement, um, that classic movie. Gregory Peck is is you know very much about that, and that's from the late '40s. So it takes a little while because a lot of this is so entrenched. You know these um, you know quotas at Ivy League universities, and these you know rules that country clubs and hotels and you know and or or, or neighborhoods, right? I mean the gentleman's agreement, the the these restrictive covenants in neighborhoods that that keep Jews that keep Jews out. Um, and so really starting in the 20s when Rubens and, and Lindy's um, both, you know, are kind of at their height, um, you know, you have this almost alternative world that Jews are living in. I mean, they go to the deli to be in proximity to the Jewish celebrities of the day. You know, I mean, like Al Jolson would give performances at the Winter Garden Theater. He'd invite the entire audience back with him to Lindy's for a sandwich, you know, and I'm sure a lot of people went, you know, <laughs> I mean, it was like, wow, it was like, you know, this is, this is where not just you could maybe rub shoulders with some famous, you know, Jewish person, but, you know, if you think about it, you know, the, um, the walls were plastered with pictures of celebrities, right? The um, sandwiches themselves were named after the celebrities of the, of the day, you know, I mean, these places were completely imbued with like the glitz and the glamour of that celebrity culture. And I think it was a kind of, you know, it was in some ways, you know, it was a, it was, it was, it was a vicarious, you know, feeling of being accepted in America. Well, and yeah, you're right. And I think that with the next, it's that way with the next slide, which is of the stage deli, which again, um, is the mid 1950s. And you have, obviously it's, it's on seventh Avenue. It's near all of the theaters and um, it's that same, uh, it's that same atmosphere, but I think that began to change in the 60s. Could I have the next slide, please? With this campaign, with this ad campaign, Levy's Rye Bread, you don't have to be Jewish. Um, and the campaign was, was done in the mid 60s, right? It says 1970 here. Um, but 1960s, that's yeah. when, isn't that when the exodus, I mean, the exodus out to the suburbs really began in the mid, in the fifth, late 50s, early 60s. But then you have this ad campaign that begins to direct itself to people who are not Jewish. Right. So this is not totally new, you know, in the 60s. I mean, already in the 40s, you know, you have, I mean, look, what happens is, you know, I was just saying, like a lot of these, you know, Jews come back from World War II and, you know, they've been exposed to other cultures, other parts of the world, whatever, you know, the, they've been living in these much more hospitable climates <laughs> in the South Pacific or whatever with palm trees and, you know, um, and, um, you know, so, you know, there's this huge exodus out of New York entirely, you know, to, um, 
there's this wonderful book by Deborah Dashmore, um, To the Golden Cities, about the, the Jewish movement to Miami Beach and to, to LA. Um, and I mean, you know, I mean, now everybody talks about it. everybody's leaving the, the, the Northeast and moving South and moving to the Southwest and whatever, but <laughs> it was really happening. You know, I mean, maybe Jews were trendsetters in this regard in some, in some ways. Um, but um, yeah, but as I said, also there were non-Jews who were learning about Judaism for the first time. So, yeah. you know, delis were declining. I mean, already by the post-World War II era, delis are really declining as Jews are moving to the suburbs and these right. companies have to find a, a larger customer base or they're not going to be able to stay in business right okay and then let's have the next slide please now here's a deli in chicago mm -hmm. that's my hometown but um but i remember growing up in the suburbs of chicago um i'm not going to date myself but i will in the 60s and my little town and you know the northern suburbs had two delis on it on the same street so that the delis and i never went to man to man to manny's but right. those delis were out in the suburbs again, which really does show the flow of not just the Jewish um, populations, but a lot of the populations. So again, it's about the history of New York and the history of the US that people begin to move out of town. Um, could we have the next slide, please? This brings up another issue about what, the gel what happened with the delis um, mm -hmm. in terms of survivor stories. And I honestly didn't know this, but that when a lot of survivors came back, came here in the 50s, um, the one place where, as you said, um, was as important perhaps as the synagogue was the deli. So a lot of them, um, a lot of them went to the delis to get work. So can you talk about this? And I'm going to show you this slide and the next one, which has the same, is on the same topic while you're talking, we can move to the next one. Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is an interesting aspect of the exhibit that that a lot of people might not they might not think so much about you know the connection with the Holocaust and with survivors. But Abe Lieberwald at the Second Avenue Deli, you know, um, hired quite a few survivors to to work for him. You know, they they really didn't have a lot of options in terms of their employment. So you know, he was a real mensch in, in a lot of ways. And his you know still unsolved murder is you know really um you know it was terribly terribly tragic can go back to the other slide please while ted's he, talking go on Ted. he was such a beloved figure in in new york you know for decades mm -hmm. um and the second avenue deli i think also you know played a really important role in terms of you know i mean they were i mean they were they, they were obviously like you know wanted to get publicity so they would make these huge you know sandwiches and these busts you know like out of chopped liver of like famous, you know, athletes or whatever, they'd give away a free salami every time someone hit a home run, you know, or whatever kind of thing. Um, I mean, he was a genius <laughs> when it came to marketing, but um, but also, I mean, you know, like the second Avenue Deli had a reputation as being a place where, you know, that was just very Hamish. And- it was, um, even though it's on Third Avenue now, it still does, right? Yeah. We're gonna yeah. push on so that we have time for, um, questions yeah. because i'm yeah. sure there are a lot of questions but can we go to the next the next slide and the next slide after that and the next one there all right so this is this is the last slide but i think one of the beloved parts of this exhibition because what you're looking at is not a photograph of the inside of cats's but it's a it, it's a work of art um and it's like a diorama it's like you know when we were kids and we used to have to do these dioramas well this is a professional one um, where you look in and it's got all of the every detail that you might want from Cass's Deli. But again, almost is put on a pedestal in the exhibition, but it's become a part of pop culture. But this is almost um, a jewel within itself as an artwork, but also as one that leaves people with so many different memories. Uh, as the Deli enters pop culture, we all, whether you know, our parents or our grandparents came from, quote unquote, the old country. Um, I think this brings everybody back together because we're talking about now pop culture here in the U.S. and how that affected, was affected in terms of the music in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, in terms of Mrs. Maisel, which it takes place in the 50s and 60s and 70s um, and is coming on for another um, year, uh, another season. Uh, but it's this pop culture thing that everybody can relate to. Um, so I'm going to stop now and tell people to, number one, come to see the show if you haven't. And number two, read, um, read Ted's book because it's fascinating. 
it's really fascinating. And uh, we're going to start with some questions. Okay, um, the first question is, how much did home cooking compete with delis in the early days? When did the balance shift? I mean, you know, it, look, I remember I told you my grandmother was not an immigrant herself. She was a child of immigrants. But I remember her saying to me that they never ate out when she was growing up in Brooklyn, in Manhattan and in Brooklyn. They never ate out. They just, you know, it just wasn't something that, you know, and 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 as I said, I don't think it had to do with necessarily like kosher reasons or whatever. Um, it just it we we just take it for granted. I think I think statistically, we eat most of our meals out or <laughs> or get most of our food cooked. You know, it's like this really interesting thing in which you know food is so much about nurturing and about family and whatever. If you ask somebody, you know, like what are their strongest associations about food, then they'll come up with all this very Hamish kind of stuff. And yet, then when you really reflect on it. Anyway, <laughs> that we hire people to do the cooking for us almost all the time. Um, you know, it's really kind of funny. And so, but I think one thing that it's important to emphasize is that the kinds of foods that you would eat in the deli were not the kinds of foods you could eat at home. I mean, it was just way too labor intensive. And I think that was part of what made the deli appealing to be able to eat these, you know, to eat, you know, corned beef or pastrami or whatever that, you know, had been, you know, it taken so long and been, sit, been sitting in, in barrels or brine and the pickles, or whatever, and the weeks, pickles, right? And the you know, pickles. Or the pickles or whatever. This is like it's just incredibly labor intensive. And 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 another reason why I think delis, we haven't mentioned this, but another reason why I think delis started to decline so precipitously in the post-World War II years, when Jews were able to get a good education and be able to get better jobs and be able to have professions, is because the, the children of deli owners didn't want to go into this backbreaking work, you know, ah. these 18 hour days. And they didn't have to. Yeah, that's true. Well, you know, somebody has asked a question, have Ratners and Rappaports been mentioned yet? Do you want to talk about the... No, I mean, these are dairy restaurants that, um, you know, in some ways were similar to delis. I mean, one of the ways, I mean, the food was different, right? They, they weren't selling meat. Oh, Ratners. Um, <laughs> they I'm were selling blintzes and, yeah. you know... Potato soup and blintzes. Potato soup right. and cabbage soup and kasha and stuff like that. There were also, um, by the way, in addition to dairy restaurants, there were cafeterias in the garment district, big Jewish cafeterias, you know, that served mm -hmm. the people who worked in that neighborhood that are very, you know, there's a lot of nostalgia for, 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 for those kinds of places. Um, and then there were advertising stores like Russ and Daughters, which is still there today, but places right. that would sell bagels and, right. you know, fish right. and brugelach. And still, and I mean, Zabar's, Zabar's is an expanded. And Zabar's, and is Dean and DeLuca still around? That's more Italian, right? Um, so, uh, yeah. So, so you had all these different kinds of Jewish, you know, takeout stores, eateries, and so on and so forth. Um, one thing that was similar about the dairy restaurants, and there's, by the way, a great book by Ben Catcher about the dairy restaurant, which I really, really um, recommend. It's just called The Dairy Restaurant. It came out several years ago. Um, is the um, the very strange, very wonderful, bizarre tradition in Jewish delis and dairy restaurants of having waiters who would be very um, demeaning. Well, yeah, I remember <laughs> rappers for that. <laughs> <laughs> and well, would tell you where to sit and tell you what to eat and tell you weren't eating enough and you know berate you and. You know, and I, you know, I spent a lot, a lot of time actually sort of puzzling about that. You know, like why would somebody want to, you know, don't you want to get a good tip? Like, why would you treat somebody like that? And then I realized that a lot of these waiters were probably themselves, you know, former comedians or actors, you know, on the Yiddish stage or the American stage or whatever. Um, and also, I think the deeper thing is that, um, you know, I think a lot of them were really, you know, consciously or not, you know, very resentful of the fact that as Jews were becoming more openly upwardly, as their customers were becoming more upwardly mobile, they were very much stuck in these, you know, very, you know, painful, difficult um, occupations. I mean, I'll never forget going to the Second Avenue Deli, we talked about that. Um, there was a waitress there named Diane Kastner who was there for decades. If people, you know, used to go there, you know, decades ago, they would remember her. She had, I mean, she was unforgettable. She had these like, you know, she was dripping with costume jewelry. She had that black lacquered beehive hair douche. Her face was pancaked with, with makeup, you know, and I would order the matzo ball soup and, you know, they, they, in order to keep it hot, you know, you have your empty bowl and they bring it over in a, in a, in a tin, 
uh, container and they, <laughs> and they, and they pour, you know, so it stays hot. And every time she did that, she'd have the same shtick, you know, she'd say, you'll be the richer, I'll be the poor. <laughs> well, okay. Another question is when did Delhi stop being kosher? You know, it's such a good question. Um, it's so hard to know, um, you know, like, and when you say stop being kosher, it suggests that they were kosher and then they weren't kosher. Yeah, I think that's yeah. probably true. Were there any delis that weren't kosher, you know, you know, 100 and, you know, 30 years ago or whatever, 140 years ago. I don't, I don't know. I mean, Katz's itself, you know, is not kosher. Did it start out as kosher, you know? Um, but certainly, I mean, you know, it was like the 19 teens when you start to have these famous non-kosher delis that like, you know, like Arnold Rubin, you know, is like the, seen as maybe, you know, like the Rubin sandwich, <laughs> the, you know, but you, you start to have, as we were talking about those delis in the theater district, like Lindy's and Rubin's, um, they're kind of in full flower by the twenties, but they, you know, you could, you could sort of date that phenomenon to the teens. Can, can you distinguish for those who might not know the difference between Jewish and kosher? Is kosher just with kashrut? and Jewish. Yeah, it's an interesting, complicated question, actually. You know, I mean, normally we think of kosher as being, you know, a kosher restaurant being a place where, you know, only kosher food is served, meaning that, you know, meat and dairy dishes, you know, meat and dairy products aren't mixed. There are separate dishes for, you know, usually either, usually a deli would only sell meat products. You do see some exceptions to this as well. Um, and a dairy restaurant would sell only dairy products. So, you know, certainly in a kosher restaurant, you know, the twain never should should meet, you know, and, and if you're gonna serve meat, it has to be killed and butchered and soaked and salted and everything that has to go through in order to be, you know, to be kosher. Um, you know, you can't sell any animals that aren't kosher, right? <laughs> um, so, but then a lot of people say, well, you know, the funny thing is though, you had a lot of delis that were kosher in terms of the, the, the meat that they served, but they were still open on the Sabbath. So wouldn't that be a problem for an Orthodox Jew who A, wouldn't eat out on the Sabbath because you're not supposed to handle money or transact any business or be in a place of business. Um, but also like they wouldn't trust that the deli was really kosher because if it's if it's gonna flagrantly, you know, um, you know, disregard the Sabbath, then you can't trust the people at all. They're they're you know they're 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 they don't know anything about Jewish religion or whatever kind of thing. But the the reality actually is that the vast majority of these kosher delis in the twenties, thirties, forties, whatever were open on the Sabbath. And the reason for that is because that honestly question. they couldn't survive any other way. The weekends were the main, you know, the biggest. So did that make them non-kosher immediately because they were open on Shabbat? Did it make them non-kosher? I mean, if it was really truly yeah. kosher, then they wouldn't. I mean, the, hard. Jewish, the kosher grocery hard. stores today are not open on Shabbat. It made it hard to find a rabbi who would, you know, who would say that the establishment was kosher. But then, you know, you could always find a rabbi. You know, I mean, like that was a that was not an insuperable problem. Let's put it that way. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I certainly interviewed for the book. I mean, I interviewed people who said, look, you know, like I grew up in an Orthodox family in New York, but if we, you know, walked past the deli, it had a Hebrew national sign in the window, you know, the neon sign, whatever, you know, we wouldn't eat there on Shabbat, but we'd eat there, you know, because you know what, the, we, the world was very different in those days. I mean, now you have such a, you know, like separation between Jews who are, you know, like glot kosher, you know, Orthodox and Jews who aren't that there's almost no mixing actually you know i mean i i mean obviously sometimes in the workplace you know whatever um but for the most part these are separate communities who live separate lives and it didn't used to be that way i mean the, the thing that really you know pains me in a lot of ways about the the decline of the deli is that this you know really crucial communal gathering space doesn't exist anymore i mean i mean that that really brought together sort of you know first of all in the earlier days, Jews from all different parts of the Pale of Settlement. So it sort of, it sort of molded this kind of unitary American Jew in a way. <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't say that nowadays because nowadays, of course, we understand that Jews can come from all over, all different places, be all different races, and whatever. We're finally sort of waking up to that. But when the vast, vast majority of Jews were Eastern European Jews, but they came from different countries and different languages and to some extent different cultures, right? Um, the deli was a place where everybody could kind of, you know. Be the same. 
be the same, you know, time. and also different religious observance, different social class, different everything, you know. But it was a community they found. Yeah. As you once said, it was a community that became like the synagogue, but it was the place where you ate together. So, and I love that. These synagogues right. were, I mean, look, in the first, you know, on the Lower East Side, there was, there was the synagogue for the Greek immigrants and there was a synagogue for the Polish immigrants and there were whatever, or multiple synagogues, right? Um, and even as time went on, I think, you know, for the most part, you know, people still kind of kept to their own, even in like whatever, you know, in synagogues. Um, the deli was, Food is like the universal language, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> and not just for Jews, but for non-Jews as well. You know, like there were, it was, it was like one of the first places where African-Americans were, you know, were welcome and were, and were comfortable, you know, when they about, weren't really if, allowed. If somebody America. wanted you to talk about Jews in the 1930s, not about the delis in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And that, what your, your statement just led me to that. What, how many delis were there in Harlem in the 1930s? I'd have to look it up in terms of how many but were not specifically. But in Harlem, but there were delis. I mean, you know, I mean, we looked at a picture of one that was from 31, I think, but it was, you know, it wasn't right. 20s, like the height of the Harlem Renaissance and whatever. But during the Harlem Renaissance, I mean, that was a very mixed Jewish black neighborhood, you know? Um, I have lots of pictures in my collection of delis in Harlem. Well, that's because the Jews moved to Harlem and then the blacks moved to Harlem, right? So there was a time when there was the two of them together up in Harlem. And I would imagine that's when the delis were up there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what somebody asked uh, a few people asked a very interesting question that I had never thought of. Would delis provide cholent before before Shabbat? I haven't Did seen they that. Ever do that? Hmm? I haven't seen that. I mean, um, you mean take out? Yeah. Right. <laughs> take, <laughs> take out. Take out cholent. It's actually a cool thing. I mean. You know, something for you to research now. <laughs> yeah, that is. I mean, one of the things about cholent was that at least like in Eastern Europe, you know, it was like, I think it was one of the things that was cooked in like communal ovens. It wasn't- Okay, so let's say, let's first explain what cholent was to those people who are cholent listening, this, who might not know. It comes from the French show, you know, from the word for being hot. You know, it was a hot stew um, with meat and beans and barley and carrots and vegetables, whatever you want to put into it. That, um, see, the thing is cholent traditionally cooks you know, the whole point is that you're not allowed to light a fire on the Sabbath. So you need something that you can basically leave on the stove and just leave on a low flame, you know, for the whole 25 hours of the Sabbath from, you know, sundown on Friday night to three stars in the sky on Saturday night, you know, darkness, whatever, on Saturday night. Um, and so the, the, the reason why cholin is so delicious is because it's this long simmering, you know, casserole, basically. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess you could make it for takeout, but it would not. <laughs> <laughs> I've never thought of that, but maybe, maybe it was done. I don't know. It's a great idea. Well, it's a great market. Whoever came up with that, you got a good marketing idea there. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. Because more than one person did ask that question. That's so um, I never heard that before. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to pick one more question. Um, and Let's see, how much cooking, how much did home cooking compete with delis in the early days and when did the balance shift? Last question. That's what you asked me already, didn't you? I already asked you that. <laughs> All right, let's talk about seltzer. Mentioned, can you talk about, uh, the seltzer was not just about being with other Jews, as you say, home delivery was important as well. Can you talk about the demise of the seltzer man and related home delivery services? I'm actually not that much of an expert on that. My friend Barry Joseph wrote a whole book on seltzer, which I very much rec recommend. It's called Seltzer Topia or something like that. I have it on my shelf, I, you know, whatever. Seltzer but, and egg creams, but you know. That, yeah, egg creams, yeah. I love it. Right, and there are no eggs and there's no cream in egg creams. You want to tell people what's in egg creams, really? Egg creams seltzer. Seltzer and, um, and chocolate syrup and- You milk. bet chocolate syrup, right? <laughs> it's a milkshake with- with a uh, bubble. <laughs> <laughs> also, you know, I mean, for people who are from Chicago, they don't have egg creams in Chicago. They have, they have what are right. called phosphates. That's you right. Know, Chicago. So, you know, they That's have chocolate really phosphates right. and raspberry phosphates. I've been collecting some. Oh, those were egg they creams. I never phosphates. really, yes, we had phosphates. We didn't have egg creams. I didn't know what a egg cream was until I came to New York decades ago, but that's very interesting. Okay, we could go on forever, um, but we have to call a stop to this. 
I hope everybody has really enjoyed what we've had to say. And um, I just have some closing comments. Um, thank you all so much for your participation and for your exceptional support of the New York Historical Society. We also hope you'll come and see see our exhibition, which is on view until April 2nd. So there's lots of time to come in and see it. And we also have, again, I keep saying this, Ted's book at our shop. Thank so, you. And I'm also available if people want any kind of a talk at a, you know, Jewish at a synagogue. <laughs> Whatever, I'm, 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 I'm available. So, um, and I do them all over the country. So I'm happy to come and what share um, yeah. all about the history of the Jewish deli. And uh, we, what we didn't get to talk about so much is um, sort of the future. Does the Jewish deli have a future kind of thing? So we'll have to- Oh, well, I would love to have that conversation with you. I think yeah. that it won't die out, but we thank you all for coming. We hope you have a good upcoming weekend. Um, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. And happy holidays. Happy to